Hey there, and welcome back to the Total Potential Podcast. It's Cole. I'm so excited today to be joined by our guest, Carol Muletta. She is the creator of the Parenting 411, which is a podcast, a talk radio show, and an amazing platform to provide custom tools and resources to parents to support healthy childhood growth and development, help instill confidence, and really promote a harmonious family environment, which, right, like we just want those things so badly for our kids. Um, and for our own experience. And Carol really views parenting as a ministry of God. And I cannot agree more with this, right? Like these little souls are put into our hands and it really requires a lot of intention and an open heart to create the space where they get to grow into exactly who God made them to be. Um, so I'm just so excited to have her on the podcast. Let's go ahead and get started. Carol, thanks so much for being with me today. I'm really excited to get to share some of your insights with our audience. Well, thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. Um, before we kind of dive into the topic for today, which I'm really excited to talk about, um, Tell us a little bit, like, what were some of the formative events? What were some of the big things that happened in your life that even led you to a space where you, you know, found this parenting work to really be um, something you're passionate about? Well, I'd say the big formative event would be the birth of my twin sons, who are now uh, 23 years old. Wow. Uh, but really, that experience just really changed the trajectory of my life, honestly. Uh, when they were uh, born, I had been on leave from uh, maternity leave from my job in corporate marketing and fully expected to be going back. Mm -hmm. uh, I really, I, I did a lot of research on, I talked to adult twins, all of these things. I did everything just because I figured this was going to be really easy and fun uh, summer camp kind of experience with the kids. I would hang out for about four months and go back to work. And so, of course, uh, it didn't work quite like that. I mean, up until that point, everything was just a uh, textbook. Like I even, I didn't even take maternity leave before. Like I didn't do bed rest or anything like that. My doctor said, just keep on going as long as you feel feel good, keep going. I can write a note anytime you ask me to. Hmm. So for that reason, I worked right up until I had the, the boys. I didn't even get my two weeks. I was going to hold on to two weeks where I just kind of sat there and ate bonbons <laughs> yes. and watched videos before they were born. But I didn't even get those because I worked right up until. And so uh, they were born, uh, instantly fell in love with them. And and so what happened was I kept extending my leave, like mm. two more months, two more months, all the way up to a year. And to say that uh, I kept extending my leave and I fell in love with them, that doesn't mean it was easy. It was surprisingly sure. uh, a lot harder than I thought. I hadn't spent a lot of time with uh children and babies and you know they were my cousins or my nieces and nephews but I wasn't 100% responsible for them I really sure. didn't take care of them I played with them yes and so, <laughs> and so there was just so much more and and I was definitely a planner strategic thinker I just like things to go in order and naturally they those two came here uh didn't know anything about my plans didn't care anything about my plans so i really had to um you know step back and let go of what i thought it was and lean into what it is at that moment and so uh i really had to get myself uh, a little more organized so that i could really um take care of them and not be so worn out mm -hmm. myself and so at about uh, 13 months, uh, one son was diagnosed with developmental delays. And so, of course, once you know we had different evaluations done to really get a handle on what he was going to need. And so once I realized uh, the different specials he'd need to see just to, to make sure we got him ready uh, for school, you know, mm. kindergarten, 
uh, I just decided that uh, he was going to be seeing too many people spending too much time in a car for me to allow someone else to do that. It mm. needed to be me. And I'm really thankful that um, I made that choice. Uh, of course, it was it allowed me to spend more time with him, but it really uh, caused me to do a really deep dive into child development and really human development that I'm not sure I would have done, honestly, mm. if that challenge uh, hadn't presented itself. And so I don't know, the boys were probably about two years old. And by then I had decided I wasn't going back, still thought I would, uh, I did start my own a company at that point and thought I would go into that marketing and sales consulting. But when they were about uh, two years old, um, God spoke to me in a dream and said that all of this that you're learning uh, and to help you take care of your own children, you're going to share this with other parents. And I was like, you've got to be kidding. I mean, everything that I had done academically had really prepared me for a successful career in corporate marketing. Wow. This thing here, I mean, I've, I've just been doing this two years. I mean, what do I know? What, no parent, no parents want to hear what I have to say. And he's like, yes, they will come to, they'll come to see you speak. And I said, uh, I, I, I just don't know. I don't know how to do this. And I kept naming things that I didn't know how to do. And he actually pointed out people in my life that know how to do those things. Like whether mm. it was a patent attorney or whether it was an event planner and all of these things. And so <clears throat> I, I just said, I, I, I can't believe, I just can't believe anybody is going to want to hear what I have to say. And he said, yes. And they're going to pay to hear what you have to mm. say. And so, uh, and then the last word was really, but get them into kindergarten first. Hmm. So I had three years um, conceivably. And still the, the, that vision was just really so big for me. So I can't tell you that three years later, I started my company. It probably <laughs> was more like seven years sure. later because it was just scary. Yeah. And so um, I started a company with a friend and we did that for uh actively probably about six years, probably held onto the company about five more years. But I really um, spread off from that and started in radio. I had a radio show for six years, a parenting radio show. And uh, after that, I decided to go into podcasting because it just allowed so much more flexibility. And in the meantime, I also uh, worked on professional speaking and training in that realm as well, because that's what he told me that I would yeah. be doing. And plus, I, I I always sort of liked it even before I really had training in it. And so that really brings me to where I am today. And I've also had um, participated in six book projects as well. Wow. That's incredible. I um, It really stands out to me that you took a like an actual dream <laughs> mm -hmm. and words that were spoken to you and really followed that. I think for a lot of people that would be super scary, but I mean, what an amazing testament to like, just follow it. That's just so beautiful. Tell yeah. us a little bit about like kind of the broad scope, like how now are you serving parents and connecting with people? You know, what does that look like to kind of dive into some of the, these big areas where parents really need a lot of support? Well, I do work with them uh, in private coaching and consultation. I do that as well. Mostly it's public speaking. I speak on a lot of uh, platforms. I'm asked to come on and speak on platforms, virtual, lots of virtual work, obviously, yes. since <laughs> uh, the pandemic and some, um, some in-person work as well. I have about three signature talks that I that I like to do. I also host the Parenting 411 podcast, which is weekly. And as uh, you know, book projects come up that where I feel like I have a message to share, I do. And then I've also um, published two of my own books. One is my mini motherhood memoir, which is called Mother's Work, Pearls of Wisdom and Gems from My Journey, mm -hmm. where I talk about the anchors that um, I held on to during um, my time in the trenches, parenting young children, and really hoping that it would serve as a blueprint for other mothers to not get overwhelmed by it all, realize that they are bringing something to this task, this uh, wondrous journey of parenting, that there are other 
experiences that they've had in life that have prepared them for mm. this. And to find out, to pick out those guideposts or anchors for themselves so that they can then chart their own journey because we all have our own unique journey because all of our children were given to us for a purpose. We were the ones that God selected to guide them to reach their full potential in life. And we have to create it and, and not try to make it look like our friends or yeah. even our sisters or brothers uh, journey with their children. A hundred percent. Yeah. That lands big time. <laughs> Very, <laughs> so true. So I'd like to shift gears a little bit into kind of our big topic for today around communication and mm -hmm. I, the reason I'm just so excited to even share this topic and learn from you today is I feel like this is a place where well-intended relationships can really break down quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so tell us first a little bit, like, what are some of the challenges in communication that you see in families? Like, what are some of the patterns or, you know, hurdles that end up coming up often around communication that are really challenging in the family dynamic? Well, one thing I, I believe that parents forget is that they do need to communicate. Don't assume that just yeah. because your child sees you doing things or hears you saying things that they now know what to do. Hmm. Uh, you have to really, I think we forget, we have all of these skills that we have acquired, but we forget that we acquired them over time. Hmm. They kind of came together at different points in time. And so you can't expect your child who like maybe wasn't even here five years ago <laughs> to, <laughs> to now that. have it figured out. And so I often ask parents to really imagine themselves. I use an analogy if I can, um, where I ask them to imagine that um, themselves as a child and they've just moved into a new neighborhood. And so, you know, after the house is fairly settled or everything's moved in, your parents allow you to go out and, and check out the new neighborhood. And so you do. And so you walk down the street and then you notice that there's this big crowd of people. There's like a circle and everyone is focused on what's going on in the circle. And so you, you know, push your way through to see what's happening. What, what has everyone's attention? And so you see that they're playing a game. And so you've never seen this game. You don't know the rules of the game. So you're watching intently. And then someone turns around and says, and looks at the crowd and says, it's time for a sub. And they point to you. Hmm. And you're like, I, I just <laughs> got here. I've never <laughs> seen this game. I still haven't even figured out what you all are doing, but now you're asking me to play the game. And so that game is the game of life. Hmm. And so it's our job as parents to coach our children to win because children, even at a very young age, even as infants, they come in wondering how I can fit in to what's going on around me. How can I, this is life and how can I be a part of it? How can I be connected? How can I contribute? How can I know that I matter? Mm -hmm. And so we have to, to remember that. And so our three-year-old, our five-year-old and 10-year-old and our teenager sometimes they're still trying to figure that out. And so they do things, we don't understand why they're doing them, but they're getting the attention that they need. They're getting, um, even if it's not um, useful attention or it's not a healthy way to do it, they're, tr they're just trying to do things. So it's almost like they're bumping, they're bumping up against the walls of a pinball machine for anybody that even knows what that is in this generation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But, you know, they're just bumping up against things, just the, the guardrails and the um, the boundaries. And we have to explain what those what those are um, for our children. And, you know, very much like what a coach does, explaining the rules of life. Hmm. You said three things that really stand out about kind of what we're looking for in communication, mm -hmm. connection, mm -hmm. contribution. Mm -hmm. And knowing that I matter, like mm -hmm. those, wow, I'm, I'm not sure I would have previously realized that through communication, we really are seeking, you know, kind mm -hmm. of specific things out of it. Mm -hmm. So 
in the challenges of communication, I hear you saying that there's the, the element of like, we, we build the skill over time. And then we look at our three or four year old or our 15 or 16 year old and think like, well, why don't you have it figured out yet? (laughs) Right. (laughs) (laughs) So where does one begin? Like, how do we start to navigate this journey toward better, more optimal communication with our children? Well, I have a a five point system. I like five point systems and these, you could call these the five A's and it starts um, with being available. Next, you pay attention. Next, you show acceptance. After that, you affirm them. And finally, you give them agency. Mm -hmm. So starting with being available, and I like to, I also like to call that where the magic happens, Mm -hmm. really be available, not just in proximity, but available and receptive uh, to communicating with your child. And so that means uh, unplug from the electronic devices and all of that, uh, really um, move out any physical barriers. Like, you know, if you're in the kitchen and they're, they're across the room doing something and you've got a table between you, you've got an island between you or whatever from behind that and get over there and um, connect. Obviously you're, you're making the eye contact and you're just looking interested. I mean, also get rid of the internal barriers um, uh, that to communication, such as you're thinking you already know what your child thinks, wants, or knows. (laughs) Also, uh, you're thinking about your your job or other things like that, anything other than the child that's sitting in front of you. And so that's where things can really happen when your child really believes that um, you're, you're, you're attuned to them, you're not attracted and, and you're available to them, that's where magic can really happen. And so the next step is to pay attention. And there, it's not only paying attention to what your child is actually saying, but taking the full picture. Hmm. What's their posture? What is their energy? Are they speaking faster than normal? Are they speaking slower than normal? Are they making eye contact with you? Are they very animated? Does um, does the emotion match um, what they're saying? Like maybe they're telling you um, something in a very nonchalant way, but their facial expression, their energy doesn't convey that. Like maybe they're telling you that uh, their friend um, in their class is having a stupid birthday party, right? And they didn't get invited. And, but there are other signs that kind of convey like that's, uh, that birthday party is not stupid and your child really does wish that um, they had been invited. So, um, really tuning in to, to, to the full picture of what's going on with your child and then uh, communicating with them and, and, and allowing them really setting the stage. You can really kind of ask tentative questions to try to understand um, what they're thinking. So it's really kind of a reflective listening exercise that you can do, but you're, you're being tentative. Like I'm tentative. Like I'm wondering, uh, I'm wondering if, uh, you're feeling like you you're, you're a little left out because you weren't invited to the party. Is that it? Mm-hmm. And give them a chance to um, say, well, yeah, that that's it. I thought we were friends. We played all week last week. And then I'm just really surprised that I'm not at the party or um, you know, maybe it gives them a chance to say, well, no, it's not that it's, you know, it, I think it is a stupid party. Like it's going to be, um, you know, the Ninja Turtles or something. And I really don't, (laughs) I don't like them. They're not my jam. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. So it might be that. So that's why you always ask it as a question, as opposed to telling children how they feel, how they should feel, how you would feel if it was, if it were you, because that's not the point. It's what, it's what they're feeling or what they think about the situation and try to do about three or four exchanges to really get to the core feelings, because not only are you, you listening, but you're also um, doing some emotion coaching because uh, some children, particularly young children, they don't know the full range of emotions that you can have. It's really mad, glad, happy, sad, Hmm. but there's also embarrassed, (laughs) disappointed, uh, 
fear, a lot, lots of things. But so when you uh, allow them the, to to communicate with you and and you put a word uh, put a word to it, then they can they can kind of remember that next time. Hmm. Um, you know that they feel that they can say, "Oh wow," um, you know, maybe they're feeling um, afraid and uneasy about a situation, and they kind of can get in touch with that. Um, in themselves, which could really, you know, be have um, life saving benefits, you know, depending yeah. on uh, the situation. So, um, and then when they're talking, when they are answering your your questions during reflective listening, the next thing is to affirm them, no matter what. I mean, even if you don't entirely agree with uh, the feeling or the situation, you can't relate to it. That's not how you felt when you were a child or whatever. You're just affirming their right to have them because feelings really are not right or wrong. They just are. Uh, now, what, where we can guide them is what you do with the feelings because hmm. they can't just you can't just do what you want because of the way you feel, but you can. there shouldn't be any um, judgment about the feelings themselves. Yeah. And so then finally, uh, we give them agency and that's where we inform and empower them. And that's where the uh, training comes in, because, again, we shouldn't assume that our ch- um, because our child has seen us wash the dishes, that they know how to wash the dishes or uh, or how or that they should know how to cut up the vegetables because they've watched you do it so many times. But you have to take the time. And it does take time. We, we already know, mom and dad, that you know how to do this. We already know that you are pro at this. You've been doing this like 25 years or whatever it is. <laughs> Um, give your child a chance. And so when they have um, these tasks and tool um, tasks and um, that you teach them and that you train them on, those are tools in their toolbox. And so that's something that they can contribute. I talked about earlier that they want to know that they can contribute. They're, they're tools that they can take to school. They can say, hey, I know I know this. Or I said, uh, my mom and my mom or dad, you know, we read this book and I learned um, about these animals or whatever. That That's just knowledge. That's something that they can contribute. That's a tool for them. And the same thing with life skills like um, and jobs that they might have around the house. Those are things that they can apply elsewhere. They can help out at school. They can, when they go to a friend's house or something like that, they can, they can offer to help. I mean, we all like to feel like um, we know how to, to act in certain situations. We know what to do in certain situations and we want to know that uh, we can help. Yeah. Okay. I love, first of all, I love that it's five A's because that makes it very easy to remember in terms of like (laughs) in the midst of a conversation, right? You can kind of be like, Ooh, did I, okay, yeah, then I'll go to the next one, right? Like, and I love that that number one is kind of the magic spot because if you forget everything else, (laughs) if if all you start with is just that I'm available, like what a gift Mm -hmm. that is to our children to know that they're listened to and we're present with them and we close that physical distance, you know, to really Mm -hmm. feel each other in real time. Um, I love that. Say a little bit more because I'm... Something that stands out about um, allow like giving kids words to feelings and oh, mm-hmm. helping them, you know, kind of recognize that array of feelings, but allowing mm-hmm. them to tell you, right? Like even if they're only in the neighborhood of the feeling, but you can kind of help them, oh, does it feel like that or that? Yes. And, and kind of help them pinpoint. My sense is that that would give them so much more trust in themselves Yes. For how they feel mm-hmm. in a whole bunch of scenarios, like what comes up for yes. you around create, like how, I mean, I'm imagining feeling super empowered by that and like, oh, Hey, I've got that because I felt inv- embarrassed before, but I know how that feels. So cool. I can feel embarrassed for a minute. Like what comes up for you around uh, creating that space where they can trust their own feelings through this process of uh, gaining awareness on feelings? Right. I I think it's so important because uh, they need to be able to trust their instincts because their feelings, especially uh, as they're younger and, and, and act more on their feelings, that's really a compass for them. And you want to start them learning that 
at a young age, because again, it may not be a life or death situation, but it could be a situation with friends and they're just not liking how they feel with this group of friends. Like maybe this particular group, every time they get together, they kind of start to turn on your child and, and make fun of their clothes or make fun of the way they do something or something that they're not able to do or whatever. And it would be great for them because a lot of children would kind of just go along to get along. Like maybe this is how it is with people or whatever, mm. but through conversation with you about a particular situation they have, um, you can talk about being embarrassed or uh, being made fun of or, or whatever. And so then when they see that, they, they're like, I recognize this feeling. This isn't, this isn't really good. I mean, maybe these aren't the people I need to, mm. to be with. And then recognize the people that they might spend time with that where they don't feel those things, where they feel listened to, they feel heard. Like that's a good feeling. I and mean, like, maybe I didn't know, or I hadn't been paying much attention to this girl or this boy over here, but actually I, I really enjoy myself when I'm with them, you know, because they may have the idea that they're supposed to like this other group because they're the cool people or whatever, but when they find themselves in that group, they don't actually feel cool. They don't, they don't enjoy themselves. And that's kind of out of alignment for them. And so having these kinds of conversations, letting them know that their feelings matter um, and that they should tune into them can really be empowering for them. And then also it goes without saying too, that when they feel um, unsafe or uncertain, uh, you know, allow them to tap into that. I feel that. And then you can have, uh, you can role play some things they can do. Like, because I'm feeling like this, I'm going to go get some help. I'm going to go talk mm. to my teacher, or I'm going to, I'm going to separate myself from this situation. And that's, that's just so important. I mean, to, to not only be able to do that with their peers, but maybe there's an adult, a stranger that comes up to them in the store or in the neighborhood or something like that. But for them to have that, that knowledge and that understanding of themselves that they can take some kind of action. Yeah, that's huge. It's and I, I love that you said like all the feelings get to be true, right? Like whatever the child feels like they get to have that. And mm -hmm. we can support with like, okay, now what do you do with that feeling? Mm -hmm. Can mm -hmm. you give some examples that maybe come up around, you know, a certain emotion that maybe a lot of kids end up feeling and like, okay, and I might try blah, blah, blah with that emotion. <laughs> yes. And that there are a couple of things with that. It's it's kind of emotion coaching and problem solving. And, and problem solving doesn't always have to do with the emotions. But yes, because your child may come come in with like this 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 visceral feeling. There's just so much anger because of what someone someone did to them. And they just I just would like to punch them in the mouth. Like I'm so <laughs> I'm mm -hmm. so angry or whatever. But you have to explain well, what do you think would happen if you, what do you think would happen if you did? Do, do you think that, how do you think they would respond to that? Also, would that change what happened to you? Like, would that change the situation? And so then you can brainstorm some other things that um, you can do. Like for um, example, and this is kind of a combination of problem solving and emotion coaching. Uh, when one of my sons was in about uh, second grade, I think it was, he um, came and told me about a, a child that was much bigger than he was, who was always in his face and just always in his personal space. And so, um, you know, he's like, well, uh, you can, you're going to call, you can call his mother, right, mom? And I was like, mm, yeah, I could, but um, he's, I, I don't, I'm not sure I'm going to do that. He said, well, uh, then you're going to, you're going to come into to school and, and, and talk to, and talk to him like the child. And I said, <laughs> I said, mm. No, we we don't really have much conflict. I, I I don't think I'm gonna do that. And then he's like, okay, I know that you're gonna come in and talk to Ms. Margot, his teacher. And I said, no, I'm not gonna do that. You are. <laughs> and his eyes got as big as quarters. Like what? 
Like I can't even believe because it's not like I'm, I'm not a, I wasn't a hands-off mom. I was very involved and sure. helpful, but he could not believe his ears that I was not going to do anything about this. And so, but what I did though, was kind of walk through, describe, have him describe for me what it was that was happening. And I would tell him, um, you know, for the, the first, the first time say, um, I don't, stop, stop doing, you know, what you're doing. I don't like this. And so then, um, if the child kept going or came back and and did it again, like really make eye contact, like look, Mm -hmm. look him in the eye and say, I mean it, stop doing this. And so, and then the third time was go get the help. Like if this Mm -hmm. was happening out on the playground or something like that, go get the help. And, And so we talked about that. But I also felt like since it kept happening that I felt like he needed to sit down and have a conversation with this student. But of course, another, I mean, the teacher needed to be present, an adult needed to be present. So we role played how he was going to go into school and ask his teacher if he could sit down with, if they, the three of them could sit down together and talk about this. And so, um, so anyway, we, we worked on it and then he went to school the next day and from from what I hear from the teacher, he walked right in. He didn't stop. He didn't put his backpack down. He didn't take his coat off. He didn't do anything. He went, he went straight to her and said, uh, "You know, Miss Margo, we have to talk. We ha- we have to talk with Billy. We have to sit down and talk with Billy." And so she said, "You know, okay." And so she made space for that. And so then they talked about the behavior and all of that. And so I really, at that time, I just wanted him to learn how to handle the situation with that child. I really hadn't looked that much further. But what I found was that he became a very good advocate for himself that just really carried him through elementary school and middle school because he changed schools. He, um, We had planned for him to go to that particular school for K through 12, mm. probably. But he changed in sixth grade, which was also an odd year to change. Normally, it would have been fifth. Mm. Um, and so, so anyway, uh, so he was in a new school with student, new students, and all of that. But his teacher said he is a really good advocate for himself. I mean, they're very his skills are very well developed. I mean, he comes and talks about what he's comfortable with, whether what he needs uh, extra help with, or just what's not going to work for him. You know, he was he's he's very um, very black and white in his thinking. You you either can do this or you can't do that. And you should listen. If the teacher said that we can't do it, you shouldn't be doing it. So, so, so that's the kind of person he was and is. And so, um, you know, they thought that, uh, you know, his advocacy skills were really well developed and then that, that really carried him forward. And, you know, that was a really blessing, uh, really a blessing for him because he, he did have challenges, sure. and, but he was always able to, um, to speak up for himself. And I really think it kind of stems from that that experience and just yeah. rinse and repeat yeah, <laughs> when right? he had challenges. <laughs> it's really an interesting, and this is, I mean, this example highlights this, but this is something that I was kind of thinking as you were even just describing the five A's, which is that mm-hmm. there's really something to be said for someone who has the skills to navigate what the average person would deem is a hard conversation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. And and these, this process, these um, tips, gosh, it's like you could approach the hardest mm-hmm. of conversations mm-hmm. through this lens and bring so much skill to the table mm-hmm. by listening intently to what the person is saying and being uh-huh. present, right? Mm-hmm. And acknowledging mm-hmm. how someone is feeling and 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 accepting that that is the feeling, right? Like these are so valuable for not only, yes, of course, children to learn, but the way those translate to even the most challenging conversations that you might have. Mm -hmm. And, and the example that you just gave, right? Like that's a hard conversation to have to march in and tell Mm -hmm. the teacher like, Hey, we need to have a talk. Like that's probably not the average kid's favorite thing to have to do in a, in a school day. (laughs) He, he absolutely was not 
um, happy about it, but it's funny. I, I mean, I've seen him apply it so many times in so many situations and I've had teachers and administrators. <laughs> I can't believe he came into the office. Like he's, you know, he, I, I remember one time the, um, they were supposed to be taking a test and kids were throwing, you know, spitballs and erasers and things flying over his head. And he picked up his book and he went to the head of school's office and said, can I take my test in here? Because I can't, I can't work mm-hmm. in there. And I mean, he was a fifth grader. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at, at that point. <laughs> so, and, and like I said, he's, he's still very much, very much like that. Um, in terms of looking out for himself. So I, I'm really thankful for that. Yeah. The other thing that really stands out is, you know, I'm always kind of thinking of like, what is it we're modeling for our kids? Right. Mm-hmm. And I feel mm-hmm. like this is a really powerful thing to model in terms of like, if your child experiences communication in this way, and mm-hmm. then goes out in the world and interacts with people who have very different styles of communicating, maybe it's dismissive or aggressive or, you know, mm-hmm. things that are very common to, to experience I'm right. in the world, right? <laughs> uh-huh. That, that like their internal antenna can go up right away. Like, oh, something's off here. Like this doesn't feel right to me. Mm-hmm. And then when they are in spaces where the communication is present and loving and, you know, all those things, like, ah, this feels more <laughs> like what and, I know and look for. What comes up for you and just being able to model that for our kids? Well, I mean, it's important even for ourselves and in, in, in our situations and, and, and when they see how we handle situations, that's that's really important. But I also, I do think I do think ahead for um, beyond for children, like when they're become teens and then they start dating and these kinds of things. Um, it's important for them to understand what respectful relationships look like, uh, what it feels like for people to listen to them, uh, um, to respect their opinion, and all of that. And so, if you're doing that at home, then then they're not they're not likely. Um, to accept that, accept less than that um, mm-hmm. in those situations. Like another thing that I think is really important is just the idea of um, sitting down to have meals together. I mean, in this fast paced world we live in with, you know, activities, parents working long hours and, and then even um, the electronics where we're really expected to be on far beyond nine to five. And so um you know, allowing them to see that um, that's not that's not the ideal, and that you have to respect your space and respect um, your time, and expect others to do the same. That's the core. That's a vital skill for them to take out um, into the world with them. And like um, you know, in thinking about meal time, we uh, I was thankful that we were able to really to do that a lot, uh, almost every meal. I mean, out of the seven days, I mean, I'm sure we probably at least five, if, mm-hmm. if, if not six meals. And so during that time, we have conversations about whatever politics or what whatever's happening in our lives and things like that. And just giving them an opportunity to express their opinions, not automatically dismiss it out of hand, um, ask for the basis of those opinions. Uh, where did they get that information? How reliable do you think that information mm-hmm. is? And that kind of thing. That's a skill that they can take to a course school. That's their first major community, but also just out in, in the real world and how they can defend their position and feel comfortable. Uh, also being able to ask questions because I mean, I don't know about you. I'm a good bit older than you, but I know that children weren't allowed to ask a lot of questions when sure. we were younger. It's it's just the way it is. It's mm-hmm. because I said so. Love you, but it's because I said so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, but allowing them to respectfully, you know, and I emphasize respectfully, question whether it's house rules. Why do we have to go to bed so early? Why can't we why don't you allow us to watch this show when our friend is able to watch this show? Those kinds of things, um, hear them out because that that makes a lot of difference. And that can really um, cut down on a lot of what we would call misbehavior or mm. temper tantrums or 
um, power struggles, because a lot of times it just makes a difference being heard, even when the answer is no. Yeah, so true, right? Just for a kid to hear like, I get that that upsets you. Right. Oh, okay. She gets that I'm upset. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> That's progress. <laughs> right. If you, what would you say of those five A's is the one that maybe trips the most people up? Mm. <laughs> wow. The one, I mean, a lot of it is being available because mm. we think that um, we're here. They know they could come talk to me anytime. You know, I'm I'm in the house, yeah. <laughs> but that doesn't really mean you're available. Um, but I would say that one, and I'd have to pick another one, and that is the agency, hmm. like really giving them the opportunity to learn from consequences and own own their behaviors and and be accountable for their behaviors, not rushing in to rescue them, but really giving them room to operate, is a close close second. Yeah, I could totally see that. It's really easy to get into like fixing mode Yes, as a parent, right? And it comes from a really well-intended place. Like we just don't want to see their hearts hurt or, you know, struggle. And, and yet those are, you know, some of the most valuable places to learn and gain skills that take you way past childhood. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, when you think about like, if this feels brand new to somebody, if this feels like this would be a real switch for them in the way that they communicate, what might mm -hmm. be like some easy types of conversations to start working through this process? And and maybe let's, I don't know, probably helps to define an age uh, mm -hmm. to, to think about in, right? Because what you might say to your 17 year old is gonna be real different <laughs> than your two or three year old. But let's take like a young school age kid. If a parent feels like, Ooh, I have a lot of work to do in the communication realm. What might be like a, a an easy place to start this type of conversation? Well, I think the very first thing a parent ought to do, and it almost doesn't matter what age, you just might have to explain what took you so long if they're 15. But, <laughs> uh, but I think that starting a habit of spending special time with your child. And so what that is, is really a time frame for younger children. It's a shorter period of time. It's especially young children, three, three to five or something like that. You're talking about 15 to 20 minutes, but in that amount, in that amount of time, you are completely focused on them. You're talking about what they want to talk about. You're playing the game they want to play, even if it's for the 20th time, <laughs> they keep selecting it but that's what you're going to do. Um, and you're going to hold to that time. You're going to honor that, you know, the 15 minutes or whatever it is that you can do consistently for younger children. It needs to be every day mm -hmm. um, as they get into more activities and there's more logistics involved with getting them to school and all that, then um, it, it can be for, um, 30 minutes to an hour um, every every couple of days or for by the time you get to um, high, high school, it might be um, once a week, but it's an hour where yeah. you're really plugged in. And so during that time with particularly with the younger children and you're playing the game, ask them questions about the game. Like if you're playing with Barbie or you're playing with trains, like where are the trains going and how do you want to set up the tracks? Like you want to play the game their way. Mm -hmm. And it just really gives them an opportunity to own that moment. Um, something else you can do is maybe, especially for when they get a little bit older in the later elementary school to middle school age, maybe you're working on a puzzle and that's something that's going to carry over from um, day to day, but you still honor the 15 minutes. And, um, you know, when the 15 minutes are up, because sometimes I want to keep going, you say, I really enjoyed this too. I can't wait until tomorrow, hmm. or I can't wait until we do it again. And the important thing is that no matter what their behavior has been leading up to that, like maybe they just have been, you know, especially like your, your two or three, <laughs> three year old, it's just been a rough day. You've lost count of how many temper tantrums they've had, still have special time. Hmm. because they probably need it more than most. Sure. <laughs> and so you spend that time and you, you can call it what you want. You don't have to call it special time You can call it something else, but it's really like an appointment that you have with hmm. your child. You're not going to check your phone. 
You're not going to talk to anybody else in the household. It's really just their time. And every child in the family should have this time with a parent. And it doesn't matter which parent it is. Sure. Um, and so, and so, so you do that. And then just increasingly, there's just more understanding that believe it or not, they understand you a little bit more. You're not just the boss. You're not just the person that tells them, tells them what to do all the time. You're a person you know, and, you know, and then that's just, that's just a great opportunity to talk to them about what's on their hearts, what's on their minds. And you'll just find out a lot more. And you probably notice I haven't mentioned watching TV or doing yeah. anything. <laughs> I mean, the only way at TV, I wouldn't recommend, um, you could play a game, like if it's electronics, but it needs to be it preferably not, but sure. if you did, it's something where you all can talk about stre- like why you're doing that and talk about what um, what's going on in the game or whatever. But it's best to have something in in real life uh, and, and things will come out like coloring or something like that. Coloring together. You'd be surprised the things that come out that they won't talk about if you ask them point blank, like what you do today? <laughs> How was yeah. school today? But coloring, they might say, you know, um, Lisa and her family are moving at the end of the school year. And it's like, oh, really? Is she happy about that? Are you happy about, what are you thinking about that? You know, do, you know, do you want to do something before she leaves or, you know, whatever, but you know, she might not have told you about that because she was still processing it and all of that. So it just builds, um, really builds connection. And then Without the, I don't know if they, I don't think they consciously think about it, but it may make a difference the next time you ask them to do something Hmm. or, you know, even if they don't particularly like it, they know you in a different way. They're connected to you in a different way. So maybe they won't push back as much, you know, maybe there will only be one tantrum a day (laughs) (laughs) as opposed to three, because they see you as this person that spends time with them and teaches them things. Yeah. It's really, um, I'll just say like my own experience with this type of setting, right. Where it's like one-on-one I'm here to hear you. Like my daughter is often very quiet, but when we get into that space, it's like a faucet that you can't turn on like she has so much to share and so just to kind of encourage parents like even the quiet kids they might not have a flowing stream of consciousness but like the way you get to know your child in these quieter like really intentional moments become really the like this bedrock and this foundation right that built like creates a foundation to build so much more of the relationship Mm-hmm. Off of. So I'm, I love that you shared that as a, it's one of my favorite ways to connect is like in their thing, in their space <laughs> on <Right>. their terms. <laughs> it's huge. Right. 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 And and if you do this when they're younger, uh, it really can help with the teen years and, and, and it, but if you didn't do this during the earlier years and you want to start, um, just talk to your teen, say, listen, I, I really we, this is something I wish I had done before, but this is something I just heard about. So let's try this and, uh, and really connect because the thing about kind of tweens and teens is when you start all of a sudden wanting to spend a lot of time with them that they didn't ask for, they get suspicious. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, you kind of want to ease in, let them know, Hey, this is what I'd really like to do. I realize I just really haven't been as, um, you know, I'd like to spend more time with you and, and, and all of that. And I know I, you know, we haven't been doing that, but let's, let's try it now. And, and, and then I think that it'll be um, really well received and keep in mind too, that this is just a short, uh, uh, a limited period of time. It's, it's, we know that throughout the day, you're going to be talking to your child and doing other things, but this is just a different kind of energy, a different kind of attention and focus that you're putting on on it. And it's really like an appointment, just like they see you um, keeping appointments with your, your business associates and your friends and, and all of that, then, you know, they want to see that it, it empowers them and makes affirms them to see that you value the time with them just as much. 
Yeah, it's so, so true. Wow, I love that. Tell us a little bit more about where people can find out more about you and the work that you're doing and all of those good things. Well, they can follow me at The Parenting 411 on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Um, also, I'm really excited that I have a parents, parenting summit coming up in August. It's virtual, August 21st through the 25th. It's called the Parent in Purpose Summit Back to School Edition. And so this one will have five tracks. We've got mental health and self-care. We have practical parenting strategies, school success communication and connection, which is my favorite, but also parenting in the digital age. So we'll be talking mm. about some um, some unique uh, challenges that come up because of um, electronics. And so anyone that would like to sign up for that, I'd love to have you there. It's Parent and Purpose Summit 2023.com. That's Parent and Purpose Summit 2023 dot com. We would love to have you. And we have, um, depending on which uh, registration you choose, we've got some extra goodies and bonuses as well. Awesome. Well, we will absolutely share <laughs> all of that with our uh, folks listening because who, like some of those topics you mentioned, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Even just parenting in the digital age, it's like, huh, I, I might need to take a few of the tracks <laughs> if they're because <laughs> those well, yeah, are absolutely. Some legit things that you uh legitimate topics that you mentioned through that summit. So we will yes, I'm really share excited. That. We've got some great people uh joining us. I'm really I'm I'm really learning a lot, even myself, from Excellent. some of the people that I have on. That's beautiful. Excellent. Well, we will definitely share all of that with our, with um, everyone listening um, in the show notes. Any final thoughts commu on communication that you think just really would, you know, kind of frame this up for everyone listening? Absolutely. When it comes to parenting, connection should always come before correction. Hmm. Can we like put that on a t-shirt or something? That seems <laughs> like, can I wear that around in the grocery store and whatnot? That so, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> beautiful. Yeah, I love that. Excellent. Well, thank you, Carol, so much for joining us today and sharing your five uh, tips on communication and just really giving us maybe a little bit different way of thinking about connecting with our kids in a really meaningful and intentional way. So super appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. Take care, everybody. We'll catch you next time. <laughs>